So I guess this is what having a firstborn child does to a man. G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. And as you can tell, it's been a few months since you've last saw me. Things are looking a little bit different. The hair, this thing that's going on. And I have a good reason for that, I just had a daughter, all right? So, with that being said, there are sometimes things that are more important than making YouTube content. And on top of that, sometimes you just can't afford to be making YouTube content. And then sometimes again, both come into play. So that's why I've been gone. I've been working my ass off. I've been trying to keep this whole thing together. So I hope that you can appreciate that. And for those who have stuck around, I absolutely can't stress enough how thankful I am that you have. It's been great to see some comments on here. And for those who are part of my Patreon subscription, again, I really appreciate the continued support. It's been a bit quiet lately, but I promise to try and get things going again. Um, and that being said, this is the first of uh, an ongoing series. Um, it will happen relatively every month. This is a recording from February. Um, every month I draw a name from basically a hat of people who have submitted some sketches and random allotment, a single person wins each month and I go ahead and recreate whatever they've sketched in 3D. It could be the crappiest sketch on the planet. It can be a marvelous piece of concept art. It doesn't matter. My job is basically to try and recreate that in 3D. Now for this first one, again, this was done back in February when I almost had some time to do this stuff. Um, it's from a person known as Beef 3D, Beef 3D or Beefultron, depending on where you find him. Um, he made, he's on Twitter, he's on Discord, he's all around. Um, and he sent me this sketch. And my mission, so to speak, is to recreate this in 3D, but not just recreate it like a single crappy sketch or a sculpt. No, 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 no. We're going to go a little bit further than that. My mission in this case is to create something that is almost production ready. So it's going to be sculpted, it's going to be retoppered, it's going to be rigged and textured and rendered. So I did this over the course of about 10 hours, so two days worth of work in my world. Um, and I think the results speak for themselves. I'm pretty happy with the final result, so stick around to the end to see that. Um, I hope you enjoy the video. I go through my process. It's pretty much how I do things on a professional level. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So um, enjoy, sit back, have a listen, have a watch, and I'll catch you in the video. Cheers. Okay, so starting from the top here, the idea was to not just replicate the drawing, but to change it in some way that enhances the personality traits that the original artist mentioned when he was describing the character to me. The other reason I did this was to also help myself in the sculpting process by creating basically a topographical illustration. So a simple side view and a front view helped a lot with that regard. I also felt the need to uh, modify the volumes around the head, particularly around the eyes and the hair or the tentacles in this case, to give it more of a sort of voluminous feel. So yeah, jumping into Blender, just bring in the empties with image planes attached to them. And right now I'm just blocking out the overall shape across the entire body. So you've seen me do this in my other video tutorials on character design and the same principles apply here with a more, I guess you can say alien looking creature. If you block out your volumes, it makes it a lot easier to get that sculpt up and running faster. And you get, a, I would say a better result than sort of shooting in the dark. The nice thing is that once you go ahead and remesh this uh, for sculpting, you have that base volume ready to roll. And the other great thing about this method too is that it allows you to work out where the problem areas are in your original sketch. Because even in this case, even though I've done that new sketch, you'll notice that I do modify things quite a bit, especially with regards to the leg placement and the way that the body posture is in its default stance. Um, and that's just down to the fact that I'm working from 2D into 3D and suddenly the proportions don't look quite right in 3D versus the 2D sketch. So I've gone ahead and changed those on the fly as I go ahead and sketch things through. 
Now in this particular instance, I decided to jump into the body shapes first. So sculpting in the body shapes first to get those volumes looking pretty, I guess you can say realistic, so to speak. So even though this is a alien creature, it still has those humanoid elements, two arms, two legs, etc. And I wanted the body in particular to have a nice sort of curvy character to it. So the original artist, for instance, did mention that this character does have a sort of playful sensuality to them. And I wanted to enhance that in the way that the body was designed. So even though I'm putting clothes on this character, I wanted the original artist to see what the character looks like without clothes. So if they get this model and they want to change the clothing, they can understand how the volumes help to define the way that the clothes are shaped around the body. The other thing I wanted to also make sure I got right was the, the level of voluptuousness to that character. Um, it is a curvy character, but it's also meant to feel a little bit sexy. So, you know, enhancing those sort of areas to give it that right kind of balance is really important in my opinion. And even though it is a sort of heavier character, it doesn't mean you can't enhance or create something that has a level of beauty to it that other people can appreciate. So I wanted to make sure that they had realistic stomachs, realistic thighs and realistic butts and all sort of stuff to make sure that, you know, it does feel somewhat, you know, right. Because the other thing I don't want to have is make this character feel pornographic. So I don't want to turn it into a fetishized version of the character design. I want it to feel like it can sit inside of the story that this person has in mind for their whatever their series or animations or whatever they want to think about doing ready to roll before getting into the details has really helped to get to that final sculpt as quickly as possible okay so the next process in this uh project is to do the retopo now for those who are uninformed who are just coming to this video for the first time uh, to do a retopology of a mesh that has been sculpted is really important when it comes to a larger production. So if you plan on animating a character, you need to basically optimize the mesh so that it can be rigged and animated. And this is the process by which you do that. So sit back, watch and follow through. If you want to get some more information, I have a few tips in the next commentary. All right, with the sculpt out the way, I'm happy with the level of detail that I have for the character. It's now time to start to do a retopo. So the idea here is that I'm not just making the character posed out like you would see in many, many, many other fucking ZBrush videos out there where they just sort of sculpt the character already in a pose. It's basically concept art. You can't really do much with it. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that if I'm going to give this to someone, they can do something with it. They can inspect the topology. They can use the character if they want to any way they want. Um, it's going to be rigged and ready for animation to some degree. Um, so, retopo, super important. And in the case of this character, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically the same principles you would apply to a human character. The only difference is that we have tentacles instead of hair and ears. And we have three fingers instead of four. Um, and of course, the other thing is that the legs are digitigrade. So basically, they're like hooves. Um, which ultimately actually makes it a lot easier to create the topo for that. So it's not really all that challenging. It's probably the most therapeutic part of the modeling process, in my opinion, if you know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can check out my old videos on how to do character retopo. I would actually say that it's still one of the most comprehensive tutorial series out there that isn't behind a paywall for that kind of thing. So check it out. It's super, super useful. I've had countless messages and emails and all sorts of stuff about how it's helped them so much so if you don't know what i'm doing here and you want to get more detail out of that check out my previous videos so with pretty much every model that i ever make when it comes to humanoid characters i always run into the same challenges and those challenges are usually around how to connect the head to the body and how to connect the hands to the arms <laughs> um, it's always the same case because if i'm not being as methodical as i am in my tutorial series, which is usually the case, you kind of have to model for the, the situation. Um, you usually have to try and find a way to reduce the poly count going into the body from the head and you need to find a way of reducing, I guess you could say reducing, I don't know. I don't want to have edge loops flowing from the hands up to the body into the head. So that's usually where my problem areas are. Um, so as you can see here, usually I take some time to sort of puzzle solve before I start to fill out the body. And then once I get that initial connection done, 
the rest kind of flows from there. So in the case of this character, the um, getting that was fairly straightforward. Um, and then it's just about following the edge flow or the, the sort of contours of the body to get the right kind of edge flow for certain areas. So the butt cheeks here have pretty round cheeky areas. So I wanna make sure that that is defined quite nicely in the model and also around the abs. So there are sort of, I guess you can say fat pockets on top of the abs that I wanna sort of enhance. So I wanna give it that right kind of um, definition to make it feel sort of right. Um, apart from that, the legs are really straightforward. Uh, more geometry on the knees than they are at the back because it's quite thick at the front. Um, same with the ankles, I guess you can say. That's where the ankles are in this digital grade leg. Um, I want to uh, increase the amount of uh, geometry at the back of the leg because it's going to stretch quite a bit once that thing becomes animatable. So again, knowing where the volumes are going to stretch and pull and compress is really, really important. Apart from that, the legs are really straightforward. They're basically just cylinders connected by the knees and the ankle. They're not that difficult. The nice thing about this this particular character as well is that there's no toes, so I don't have to worry about making toes. Um, and they don't wear shoes even, um, so even better. I don't have to worry about modeling any goddamn shoes. Um, I find shoes to be really annoying to, anime, uh, to, to um, model because they have to have a certain style to them that makes it feel good and cool. And there's usually always a lot of detail in shoes, so I hate doing them. For those who have been around on my channel for a while may notice that Eevee, my own character, doesn't have shoes in this film because I just can't not be fecked. Now for the hands, again, I'm kind of following my own tutorial sort of concepts when it comes to how I built the hands out, but at the same time, I'm also breaking them. Uh, I, I think in this case, with this particular model, I basically just merge all the vertices around the palm because again, one, no one's really gonna see them in this particular instance of the character, so I don't care all that much. And also when I joined them together eventually, they actually kind of worked really well when they started deforming, so merging them all into one giant fucking star in the middle of my palm didn't really make much difference and it still looks really good, so whatever. Same thing goes with these uh, tentacle hair things. Um, just extrusions, they're not ears, so um, they don't need to be all that detailed. And uh, you'll find that uh, when I go to add the actual hair itself, the tentacles that go across the head, I don't even feel the gaps behind the tentacles because they're gonna be so obscured, the skull's gonna be so obscured behind um, those tentacles that you don't even see it in the render. So basically the back of her head is kind of hollow. Um, they're not really fully connected, they're just connected enough that when they are rendered as they are from front view and from top view, that they kind of look right. Um, apart from that, I'm not going to bother doing the back of the skull because again, just like real hair on a character, especially a low poly character, uh, yeah, you just basically model for whatever can be seen. You don't really do every single detail. Because when it comes to like just adding those tentacles, there's a lot more tentacles and there is geometry for me to play with to connect to the back of the head. So connecting all that stuff would have been an absolute nightmare puzzle solving ordeal. So having to go ahead and do that, I would only do that if I was actually required to do that in a production. But when it comes to something like this, where you know it may never even be used in the other artist, the original artist's vision. So this is enough, put it that way. Um, and again, even if it was to be animated and you didn't see it, there's no real point in adding it when if you don't need it. So again, it's all about circumstance. Um, here I'm, I'm just wrapping up the fingers. So I took a break from the hands and then sort of come back to them. Because again, they're not the most fun thing to do. And there's always issues that come from, you know, depending on the character and how many fingers they have and all that sort of stuff that you encounter along the way. So again, it's always the same challenges. The bottom of the hand to be the biggest challenge versus the top of the hand. Because the way that the hands deform, the thumb deforms, and the way the creases are created when you try to deform it, you can either do that with blend shapes or you can have to um, do that. You want to try and get as much of that deformation looking right from the beginning so you don't have to worry about having to make all those bloody blend shapes. So um, here you can see again, I'm just sort of working with what I've got. And eventually I think I do. I mentioned it before, I do kind of merge the fingers, the, the, the palm together in a, in a certain way. But again, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't really matter all that much. Um, again, with this particular model, I wanted to at least give it a realistic sort of production level 
um, topology. So that means adding a mouth bag behind the lips so I can add some teeth and tongues. Again, um, there's no point in just sculpting something if you want to actually animate it, all right? You wanna be able to actually deform it in a relatively performant way. So being able to get the full topology on there is really, really important. And I didn't wanna sort of undercut the, um, the appreciation that my patron has provided over the last few months. Okay, so now we've got the retopo done, we're basically ready to put the clothes on. Now the clothing is actually pretty straightforward if you have a basic understanding of how clothes work. Um, and if you have a decent um, understanding of fashion, if you have some decent references, again, way easier to do than just going in blind. So have something on, on the side when you're doing these sort of things, it's really important. Okay, so for the clothing, it's a combination of simulation and just, just basic modeling. So now that I have those volumes set up with my topology and in essence the sculpt as well, you can do this with the sculpting geometry as well, is that it provides the right volumes for me to have the clothes sit on top of. So it's always harder to sort of model clothes without that. What you end up usually having is a character that is looking too thick or too skinny underneath the clothes. Like, like, the, skin, like the clothes themselves are so skin tight that you technically wouldn't be able to fit into them. It's sort of the same dilemma that uh, a lot of the most recent Marvel films have with their characters where the armor is just basically as thick as the body that is sitting underneath it. So like, it just looks so weird. So in this case, I wanted to make sure that those volumes were right. So I'm using the underlying geometry as well to copy that and then sort of uh, offset that with um, a scale to get you know the underlying geometry. And then I sort of modify what I need. So for instance, I don't need to have circular boob topology around a clothy top. So um, remove that and just turn it into a bunch of quads that are going line linearly across the chest. Very simple stuff. And sometimes you don't even need simulation. I mean, especially with something like this, unless you're doing like full on simulated animation, all that sort of crap, you would usually jump into something like Mar Marvelous Designer to do that sort of thing. Um, in this case, it's still a designed character, so I want to design the clothing appropriately. So again, getting the right sort of shapes and all that sort of stuff was really important. The great thing about this is that we have the sketch from the original artist, but also he provided um, image references of what inspired him for this costume. So that means I had a, a double whammy of good reference to work with here. And what else can I say about the process about creating these clothing? It was probably the simplest part of the entire process. So that means that all I was really doing is just extruding faces, extruding shapes to get what I want, and then maybe refining it with a little bit of simulation on, for instance, the apron here, or like, um, just again, just going back to the reference and just sort of trying to copy that. Um, the great thing about having that base mesh as well with the character is that stuff like gloves becomes less of an ordeal. You just basically copy the hand and it just, scale along the normals to get the shape you need Pfft, easy so again it's it's you try to avoid or you try to anticipate areas where you may have problematic processes that you need to go through so if you can do one thing right at first it makes the rest of the process much much easier and you can see here that overall throughout the entire process that i've done so far i'm working from basic things first and then moving up in complexity as i go on it's really the only way you can do it effectively without one to rip your hair out. Okay, with that in mind, a few final touches and then we're ready for UV unwrapping and texturing. All right, so then we've done the retopper. We've done the clothing. Now it's time to do the UV unwrapping and the texturing, which is really fun if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I've used Substance Painter in this case, but you can use any software really. You can use Blender directly, but I like the textures and I like the materials in Substance Painter, so I've gone with that. And it's also a lot faster. So then when it comes to the time constraints that I had for this, I really wanted to get it done quickly. So Substance Painter was the way to go. Okay, so before I go ahead and UV unwrap, I wanna make sure that any problematic areas were fixed. So for instance, the way that I, like some mirror areas that I had, I tried to sort those out first before going through and going ahead and doing my unwrap. Now again, same principles apply with any quad-based 
character rig. You kind of have to follow the contours of the body to get the best unwrap. And overall, overall, I'm going to say, pretty much every character has the same kind of loops. Unless you're going for an ultra detailed, crazy creature character, those loops are going to generally follow the same patterns. Legs, arms, torso, head, and hands. Pretty much the same. When it comes to clothes, you literally follow the seams of the clothes you just created. So, like, if you have a sleeve, look at your fucking sleeve in your shirt. Oh, there's a seam. Copy that. Very simple. Same with legs. Same with shirts. Just put the seams where the seams would be on the actual clothes. That way you don't get shit textures. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, if you need to optimize them, then do so. You can straighten them out with something like UV squares, which I've done here. Otherwise, nah, again, it depends on what you're using it for. So you need to be optimized for games and all that sort of crap. Then you optimize it. But if you're just going for a straight up animation, you've got all this data that you can work with in Blender. You don't have to worry about the optimization all that much unless you have a shitbox computer. You can go ahead and just unwrap to your heart's content and just go with whatever it generates. And that's what I've done here. Now, every time that I do a UV unwrap and bring it into Substance Painter, there's always an error because I forgot to unwrap something. It's going to happen to you. happens to everyone. You just have to deal with it. Okay, Substance Painter. Again, uh, I'm basically just going to go with a relatively flat texture set for this. I did find a few extra materials from the online library to bring into um, Substance for the clothing. But the skin, for instance, again, uh, I always start with just the basic colors. I don't worry about fancy materials because it, you just get caught up in the detail. What you're better off doing is work out the color contours across the body first, then add detail later. So if you're gonna add spots like I've done here, or if you're gonna add um, scales and stuff like that, worry about those details in the normal map passes of your substance uh, layers. Always try to establish the overall color scheme of the character first. So for instance, a white, even though a character here is like seemingly pure white, you still need to have certain sort of undertones in the skin. So for instance, I want to have sort of a blue undertone, some pink undertones around where I guess you would say some subsurface scattering would be. Um, I want to sort of get that in the character because it's still an organic character. Uh, if you just go with a flat sort of basic texture set, it's going to look flat. It's going to look like a cartoon. And if you don't want that, then you want to be able to, you know, work in a little bit more nuance throughout the skin textures. As for the clothing, again, same sort of thing. You can download a uh, material to suit certain fabrics, but you still need to sort of ingrain a little bit of stuff manually, like ambient occlusion and stuff like that, unless you want to do that in the render. So you can do that as well. Once I've done that, I've brought it into Blender done my um, imports using UDIM texture workflows. So that's what I've used for everything here for the most part. And then we're off to do our render. Um, with the eyes, I'll supply the eyes from the original artist because he had already made one. So um, he stipulated that he wanted to use them. So I've used them here and they look great. Absolutely awesome. Okay, we've got the sculpt. We've got the retopo. We've got the clothing. We've got the texturing, now it's time to do the rigging. And in this case, I just did it the fastest way possible and I've used Auto Rig Pro, the plugin that is available on Blender Market. It can be a little bit pricey, but when it comes to time constraints, it's a real, real ass saver. So check out that. Uh, otherwise you can use Rigify for the same process, up to you. Okay, so for the rigging, I have used the plugin. I've used Auto Rig Pro. For this thing and the cool thing about auto rig pro is that it actually detects digital grade legs i was actually surprised about that it actually works really well and the most recent updates to the um software at least the plugin has it's pretty awesome actually it's actually really cool like the mouth the mouth and face additions are really advanced they're really really good um i personally don't use it that much for my own work um although i probably should just accept the fact that I need to start using plugins for rigging to save myself so much headache. But um, for stuff like client work and doing things at a short turnaround, or if you had a really, really, really short turnaround, I did this whole thing over the last, over the span of two days. Um, you can get a pose in there within basically 10, 15 minutes if you know what you're doing. 
um, with some basic weight paints, a few changes here. And you can see here, you can even say, tell that in this sort of time lapse, um, it, it's not perfect. I don't have time to do the weight painting. So I've just gone ahead and added some shape keys to sort of get the sort of face shapes that I want. This is great for concepting. And uh, that's basically how it worked here. For the, the uh, teeth and stuff, I didn't have time to rig it. So I just put it in place and just sort of set it there. Although if I wanted to do it properly, it's all there for me to do. All I gotta do is put this character back to T-Pose and then just skin those teeth. But um, I wanted to just do it on the fly. Um, and then a few extra additions on the texture in Blender because I forgot to do them inside of Substance. And I find that sometimes small changes can be done in Blender faster than having to go back to Substance. So stuff like eyebrows, whatever. Very simple sort of eyeline. So there's no real point in me jumping back and forth between Substance. So I wanted to just make those very simple um, sort of additions. Apart from that, just going ahead and just doing some minor adjustments, adding some eyelashes, adding um, some personality in the face, some asymmetry, and just refining the pose a little bit with a little bit of sculpting. Um, the great thing about this is it all works on top of the rig in Blender. So um, you can make those changes on the fly and you can actually keyframe them as well. So if you only want to have a blend shape up here for a few frames, uh, as you're animating, you can actually do that, which is really cool. And then after that, I've just gone ahead and done a, a render test and we're done. And I've done a few enhancements in Photoshop and I'm really happy with the result. Um, and here's the final version in a turnaround animation. And I think, I think it looks pretty cool. I'm actually really happy. I was actually really proud of this final piece. I, I thought the skirt turned out really well, the, the bow turned out really well, and I love the expression that she has at the end. It has a bit of playfulness, it still ties back to the original sketch, but it also has my own little touches put to it as well. As I said, I didn't want it to do a direct replica of the sketch, I wanted to do something that felt a little bit more personal, and a little bit more sort of how I would probably approach the character design if I was basically directing the thing. So um inspiration awesome the original sketch amazing um being able to create it was really really fun and i hope you enjoyed watching me go through the process um over the last 20 minutes i thought it was really cool okay so that's it for this video um i hope you enjoyed it i hope you found it informative even though i've sort of breezed through a lot of the details um this is basically the way that I do my work. This is how I get paid normally to do my thing. Um, so to talk about it has been really, really fun. And I think the result speaks for itself. I love doing this sort of stuff. Um, I'm hoping that the next video will be very similar in, in nature because I have to catch up. I have to do um, the March uh, challenge. So that's gonna be really cool. I think you're gonna love the next one because the uh, this concept art that I've been sent for this one, absolutely awesome but with that being said if you have any questions or if you want to partake in this challenge feel free to join up to my patreon you get discord privileges you get the working files you get the ad free content it's all there um and of course you can ask questions we can chat you can do whatever you like and it's a lot of fun um again it's all dependent a little bit unfortunately with what's going on in my world but i try to be present as much as possible and if you just want to support the channel, um, again, uh, a dollar, a couple of dollars a month always goes a long way. So um, again, for those who have stuck around, really appreciate it. For those who are interested in supporting me to make more of this and make this more of a sort of permanent thing rather than a side gig, that would be awesome. So that's the plan. So I'd love to do that. Um, that being said, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video again. Thank you again for watching. Thanks for any likes, subscriptions, etc. And I'll catch you in the next one. Uh, cheers, have fun, and I'll see you soon.